My topic is translation and children's literature. So I shall speak from the perspective of the art, craft, and fun of literary translation. About the art of translation, do you think translation is an art? Well, let me give you an example. A year ago, during the pandemic, I translated Tarashankar Bandopadhyay's Arugu Niketan into Russian. It wasn't easy, 550 pages. <laughs> so, the very first question which we were discussing with our team of advisors for the project is, how do we name, how do we translate the protagonist, Jivan Moshai? Now, in Russian you say Gaspazin, which is uh, equivalent of Mr. with respect because Jivan Moshai was widely respected. So, or should it be simply Jivan, but that didn't seem to carry enough weight. And then after two months, we decided, let it be Jibon Moshai with a footnote for Moshai. So, since his name gets repeated so often in the book, an appropriate translation was of primary importance. So there are, now in the interest of time, there are other examples like Porer Bhat, Tulshi, Pataligur, Pronam, Mai Rachol, even Ganja. <laughs> so much it talk. My friends from Birbhum vehemently reacted when the version which loosely translates as fish sauce was chosen. Ultimately, we once again had to use a footnote. Are 210 footnotes too many or too little for a book like Arogoniketon? that is so full of mythology and spiritual references. I hope that answers the question, translation is an art. Moving on to craft, I would mention three things quickly, passion and immense patience. They say translation, if it seems easy, you are not doing it right, you are doing it wrong. Advanced language knowledge, this goes without saying, and mind for nuances. And the last is fun of translation, well, translators here will say it's rather a pain. You could be toying with a word, looking for a word for days. It just goes around in your mind, not letting you be at peace till you find the right fit. Sleepless nights, heavy responsibility of doing justice to the author, and then you are reminded of the countless number of people who will read your work through your translation and your responsibility increases. It is said, the more subtle the message, the more powerful it comes across. On that note, I would like to share a video which I, along with my Russian colleagues, have prepared, especially for you, for this concluding day of this remarkable literary festival. When you leave this venue and return home today, please do remember that meaningful literary translation of global literature is possible only through close interaction between people of different nations, between their authors and artists and readers in platforms like the Kolkata Literary Festivals and International Kolkata Book Fair. The delightful outcome of such interactions could be a Bengali or an English translation of the tales of heroes of Yakutia in northeastern Siberia or tales about the Ulgen the supreme deity of the Altai shamans in southern Siberia, or the fascinating image of a bear in I stories from Sakhalin. Out of time now. Yeah, the largest island of Russia in the Far East. Stories which we shall leave behind for our children to unravel one by one, like the Matryoshka doll. As you know, there are you know seven inside. So video, please. Thank you. Дорогие друзья, приветствую участников литературного фестиваля в Калькутте. Сейчас это тревожное время особенно важно продолжать разговор. В 
public activists carrying out humanitarian programs around the world become speakers and let their readers, listeners, viewers support them. If we speak about literature, then the front line belongs to translators who are communicators and channels of information while the information itself is not limited by ideas and thoughts but also comprises feelings, empathy, hope, love and faith without which human life is impossible. I really hope that our Indian friends are happy about our cooperation since 2020 when it became especially close. In 2020 Russia had been honorary guest in Kolkata and after that we launched several significant publishing programs including those related to literature for children. We also launched a media project with cartoons for kids. We support translations of Russian classics and contemporary Russian literature into Indian languages. We hope to continue our cooperation. We hope to be in Kolkata this amazing city next year too. Organizers of Calcutta International Book Fair are just wonderful. My special greetings, obeisances and good wishes to Mr. Chatterjee as well as to all of his colleagues for the great endeavor that they are taking despite all difficulties of the contemporary world. Good luck to you all. Best wishes. Удачи вам. Всего доброго. Dear friends, my name is Anna Goncharova. I am a children's writer. I have written 30 books, including a series of stories about two little raccoons, which is very popular in Russia. One of my books was translated into Bengali. I am very proud of it. The books always unite and support people from all over the world. I was very glad two years ago to take part in your literature festival. The hospital we will have to then I read uh, my start the next session. So can we please uh, just another three minutes if possible? I'm so sorry, no, we will not I be able to give you another three minutes. Can we please, uh, you know, close this and start the next one? The speakers have been waiting for a long time. Thank you so much. India and uh, all we do to please uh, on the photo day. Thank you. Looking forward to our future meetings. My sincere apologies, but otherwise we will completely run beyond schedule. I hope you understand. The APJ Jeet Paul Memorial Lecture will be delivered by eminent historian and writer Rudrangshu Mukherjee. But first we have Swagat Sengupta, CEO of Oxford Bookstores, to say a few lines on the memorial. Uh, good evening. Uh, we at uh, APJ Surinder Group, we are extremely excited to bring the eighth edition of uh, the Jeet Paul Memorial Lecture. Uh, for the past seven years, we've been having this lecture at the Kolkata Literature Festival, and uh, I must thank Kolkata Literature Festival again for having us over here. Uh, we are absolutely delighted that uh, Mr. Mukherjee has uh, agreed and accepted to uh, be a part of the lecture and, you know, to address us. Uh, for people like us who have been born and brought up in uh, Calcutta, and, uh, you know, who have spent their 70s and 80s in Calcutta, we all know Mr. Jeet Paul. We all know that he's been a visionary and an entrepreneur. Today, whatever APJ Surinder Group is, uh, in terms of uh, shipping, tea, hospitality, logistics, and warehousing, it's all instrumental. She, he's been the instrumental behind it. Uh, and of course, uh, Oxford Bookstore. We at Oxford Bookstore, we are celebrating our centenary year this year. And uh, this uh, lecture, this eighth uh, lecture, eight Jit Paul Memorial Lecture, uh, titled Bonds of Freedom, is a part of the centenary celebrations. Uh, I hope you do en enjoy the lecture that Mr. Mukherjee will deliver right now. Have a very nice evening. Thank you. I would like to invite on stage Rudrangshu Mukherjee, please. Internationally acclaimed as a historian of the 1857 revolt in India, 
Rudrangshi Mukherjee is an author of several books. His most recent book is A Begum and a Rani, Hazrat Mahal and Lakshmi Bai in 1857. Mukherjee has held visiting appointments at a number of universities abroad, as well as been the editor of the editorial pages of The Telegraph. He was the founding vice chancellor of Ashoka University, of which he is now the chancellor. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the distinguished audience. I'm very deeply honored and privileged to deliver the Jeet Paul Memorial Lecture. Jeet Paul was a figure in Calcutta, if I might put it like that. And those of us who have had the good fortune of meeting him, uh, he was also an unforgettable figure. Uh, it would have been apt if I could have given the Jeet Paul Memorial Lecture on something to do with the history of Calcutta. That would have been more opposite. But this being the 75th year of India's independence, the broad theme that was suggested to me was India at 75. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, India's independent India's history. Uh, India is 75 years old, which is rather young for a nation. I'm just going to look at a few features of that or a few developments of that history. And I will start with uh, a very well known anecdote or a very well known speech uh, right at the very birth of independent India. Most of you are familiar with that speech at midnight, 14th, 15th August, 1947. India's first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, uh, coined an undying phrase. He said, he opened his speech by saying, years ago, we made a tryst with destiny. That word, tryst with destiny, that phrase, tryst with destiny has gone into India's national lexicon and had remained there till Nehru became a five-letter bad word uh, in recent times. But I don't want, don't want to concentrate, as is usually done with the phrase, tryst with destiny. What concerns me is the pronoun that is used there. Uh, we made a tryst with destiny. Who did Nehru mean by that we? Who was included in that pronoun we? Who was Nehru talking about? Who did he think he was representing by using that pronoun? Uh, there are certain people which were obviously excluded. The most important exclusion was, of course, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, who refused to be part of the jubilation that surrounded India's independence. Uh, he was, as you know, in Calcutta that day, in Belaghata, which was then an eastern suburb. And he refused in any way to celebrate India's independence when the Reuters correspondents asked him on the morning of 15th of August, saying that, Mr. Gandhi, your task has been accomplished, your dream has been fulfilled. India is today a free nation. What is your message to India? Gandhi said that today is not a day for celebration. Today is a day for fasting and prayer. So that's one person who is included, excluded from the tryst with destiny that Nehru spoke about. The others are millions, not just one individual, millions of people, millions of people who were uprooted uh, on both sides of India's western and eastern borders because of the independence, the tryst with destiny was actually a fractured tryst. India was partitioned with independence. And there were, as I said, millions of people who were, uh, who lost their home, lost their jobs, their livelihood, uh, lost their relatives, 
or had their relatives maimed, injured in very te in terrible ways, those people could not have been pa part of the we that Nehru spoke about or Nehru referred to in that in that phrase. And very soon, very soon, especially after Gandhi the assassination of Gandhi on the 30th of January 1948, Nehru too became aware of the fallacy of that statement. We had made a tryst with destiny. He actually said there is madness all around. So independent India began on this note. It did not actually begin on a very happy note. It begin, began on a note of fractured lives, damaged futures, and as Nehru said, more than a hint of madness. So there is a paradox inherent in this phrase called tryst with destiny. And I'm going to argue that this paradox continues to haunt India. What is constitutive of this paradox? I would say there are two themes that constitute this paradox. One is membership, who belongs to that we, and the other is representation, who can represent the we. For whom was freedom attained? The simple answer, and a very convenient answer, is that it was attained for the people of India who are also members of the Indian Republic and the Indian nation. The opening lines of the Indian Constitution make that, make this amply clear. This same document, the Indian Constitution, by introducing universal adult franchise, also made it clear how the people were to be represented. There was thus going to be, through universal adult franchise, a division between the polity and the people. Nehru's use of we and its embedded paradox illustrates this division. It existed, it's worth underlining, before the Constitution and continues even after the Constitution came into force. I want to use the rest of this talk to present how this issue of, the, or the issues of membership and representation have snapped the bonds of freedom. And I will do this by looking at two not unrelated phenomena. The first is the emergency, or what has been very justifiably called by Christophe Jaffrelot, the French political scientist, India's first dictatorship. In June 1975, for 18 months, democracy was suspended in India. Because it was a brief transient period, only 18 months, it has become rather convenient, particularly on the part of one, one political party, to somewhat diminish the significance and the independent, uh, significance and the importance of the emergency. Actually, when one speaks of the emergency, one is speaking of very large numbers. 11 mil, mil some numbers, to tell you how, give you an idea how large the numbers were. 11 million Indians were sterilized and 110,000 Indians were locked up. In Delhi alone, of the city's five million citizens, 700,000 were displaced by the gentrification and 161,000 sterilized in programs masterminded by the son of the then Prime Minister, Sanjay Gandhi. A fifth of opposition members of parliament had been in incarcerated and the rest 
drowned out first by a media that was not allowed to report dissenting speeches, and second, by Congress parliamentarians of the lower house who passed law after law, sanctioning and widening the scope of emergency powers. Judicial independence was similarly compromised, tampered from within by preferential appointments and from without by the transfer of competencies to the executive. Through these steps and measures, institutional violence, as I would prefer to call it, the emergency ripped apart the fabric of Indian democracy. When she declared the emergency, Indira Gandhi did not actually abrogate or replace the Constitution. The political system, though undermined, remained the same as in the pre-emergency years, federal and parliamentarian. Even though many opposition MPs were imprisoned and some of them even tortured, parliament continued to function and opposition parties were not banned. A strict censorship was put in place, but newspapers and journals continued to be published, and some of these displayed courage and expressed their dissent by refusing to work under censorship. The magazine seminar and the magazine mainstream comes to mind immediately. Indira Gandhi continued to maintain the facade of democracy by ensuring that each of her anti-democratic steps was taken with the approval of parliament and constitutional amendments were carried out within the framework of the existing laws. These steps were facilitated by a compliant judiciary that she had put in place. These features produced what can be called a constitutional dictatorship, however oxymoronic that term might sound. In trying to understand the nature of the regime, it is worth underlining some of its features. The regime lacked an ideology. It was declared under the banner of socialism and secularism, both the terms were included in the preamble of the Constitution in 1976. The latter was manifest, that is, socialism was manifest in the banning of organization, or oh sorry, the latter meaning secularism was manifest in the banning of organizations like the RSS, Anand Margi, and the Jamaat Islami. The former, secular socialism, in the declaration incorporated in the 20-point program of a commitment to land reforms and public housing. But these egalitarian impulses, within quote, were swamped by nepotism and corporatist overtones of policies formulated by the prime minister. The egalitarian impulses were diffused by the phenomena of political authoritarianism and social hierarchies re reinforcing each other. Sanjay Gandhi's gentrification and sterilization drives targeted Dalits and Muslims. This reflects the extent to which caste and religious prejudice, prejudice permeated the ranks of the largely upper class elite. The emergency, because it lacked a clarified ideology, encouraged, as most authoritarian regimes tend to do, depolitiz depoliticization. Politics fosters discussion, debates, and dissent. Authoritarian regimes are anti-intellectuals, and so the perpetrators of the emergency were against not only freedom of expression, but also against universities. The absence of ideology meant Indira Gandhi could alter the tone and content of her utterances conveniently, given the audience and the occasion. To businessmen, she spoke about capital formation. To trade unions, she spoke about workers' rights. At mass rallies, her speeches were peppered by populism and nationalism. The principal target of nationalism was the United States of America, 
a power that she accused of trying to destabilize India and other third world countries. The absence of ideology also facilitated the building up of a cult of personality around herself. That rhetoric, re the rhetoric that accompanied the growth of this cult consisted of many empty phrases which could be variously interpreted to address a mosaic of concerns. The most shameful of these was the declaration of the then Congress President Dev Kanto Borua, India is Indira and Indira is India. Nationalism was the only identifiable ideology of the emergency and it was used to silence political debate. Anyone who opposed the emergency was labeled as being anti-national. Some of these might sound familiar, but I want to highlight a different point. Freedom was lost. One individual came to represent the people nation and those who descended with denied the membership of the nation. The proportions of the we, going back to Nehru, the proportions of the we had suddenly been diminished. Having a vote had become irrelevant. There was, however, this is also a point that needs to be noted, there was an attempt to enhance the ambit of that word we. There was a general recognition that government should look after populations. Government should look after its citizens. This was not without a certain amount of tension, which was caused by the contrary pulls of what might be called legitimate and illegitimate inequalities. There is little agreement on whether a particular governmental benefit is a just reward for excellence or it is the affirmation of unjust privilege or compensation for historical discrimination or the bestowing of new favors. This gives rise to the populist idea that an entrenched elite is exploiting deprived people. This become, then becomes the source of populist anger that certain types of leaders take advantage of through rhetoric and a clever and deliberate manipulation of facts. There exists in India a floating and a migrant population working in the informal sector or eking out a living on the margins of the capitalist economy. This population has full democratic rights under the universal adult universal franchise and it constitutes what Pato Chatterjee has termed political society. In a democracy, like in India, the state, whatever its ideological orientation, cannot afford to ignore this population. The state enables this population to survive and work through subsidies or cash transfers and by ignoring even condoning transgressions of laws, regulations, and the various protocols of civil society. To cater to this huge population, government policies are designed to benefit large sections of the electorate to win votes. Winning the next election appears as the principal goal. Does a born populist regimes whose aim is to garner votes and win elections rather than carry out social and economic transformation. Populist regimes have at their helm a leader who projects himself or herself as the benefactor and protector of the people and is invariably authoritarian in style and not averse to crushing any opposition by force. 
many political leaders in India, regional and national, display these tendencies and fit this description. Thus, under populist regimes, freedom is diminished and power comes to be concentrated in the hands of an individual. The we becomes confined to the I. This phenomena is pronounced and visible in India today. But the problem I have tried to suggest is not a new one. It was present at the birth of the nation and remains as a birthmark on a nation that is 75 years old or 75 years young. Freedom was a bond, a tie that brought people together. Yesterday's freedom is today's bondage. Yesterday's bond is today's bondage, pulling India towards no man knows where. Thank you. I'm told there is a Q&A, so if any of you have comments or questions, I'm happy to try and address them. Anyone has questions for Dr. Mukherjee? Are there any questions? So would you say that the idea of freedom is a Western idea which we have adopted but haven't, India hasn't understood? No, I'm certainly not suggesting that uh, freedom existed in India before the West arrived in India. That is well documented. Western freedom is just another variety of freedom. It's not the only template for freedom. Sorry? What about the idea of democracy? Well, the democracy that we practice, democracy is not to be equated with freedom. So it's a different question that you are asking. So democracy as we practice it in India today, or we try to practice in India, came from the West. But again, India had forms of democratic governance even in the past. We have evidence of Ganashanga in years before the birth of Christ. Uh, can I ask a question? So uh, is uh, freedom of expression uh, dependent on uh, the power of technology and the money that you have to control technology. Are you talking about today or you're talking, this is a general question. 75 years and beyond, beyond. Well, through the 75 years, I can't speak of the beyond. You see, uh, historians are prophets looking backwards. I cannot, uh, read tea leaves. I'm not an astrologer or certainly not a prophet. Uh, so through the 75 years, people have actually expressed their freedom of expression without the aid of technology. Technology has, is a very recent arrival in India, the kind of technology that we associated, associate with freedom today. The Facebook, Instagram, internet, and so on and so forth. A long, time, a long part of my life, at least, I'm an old fuddy-daddy, uh, has existed without this kind of technology. Uh, we have spoken in seminars, conferences. Some of the people have also spoken in mass rallies. 
without actually being restricted or being confined to any kind of technology. So I wouldn't say freedom of expression is completely dependent on uh, technology and its various ramifications, but technology certainly helps in the freedom of expression. But as we are witnessing, uh, technology can also be controlled. So through that control, you can actually restrict the space for the freedom of expression. The question at the back. There's a question in the third row, yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, it is very nice to listen to your voice. And I am just learning from you also. Just now, during this period, how we can explain the democracy? Now, how we are enjoying democracy? Can you explain this? That time, that in uh, emergency period, when we enjoy the democracy that was lost. And that period, the Indira Gandhi period, you see, Oh, sorry, speaker. The period of emergency, you said about the period of emergency, when we enjoy the democracy, that, is, that was not democracy. Now, during this period, how we are enjoying this democracy? Actually, I was trying to emphasize or highlight that there are certain parallels that exist between uh, the period of the emergency and what is happening today. And one of the key parallels of that is populism, the convergence of, or the concentration of power in the hands of one individual, and the use of rhetoric and the misrepresentation of facts. I find all these phenomena to be anti-democratic in their essence. Now, I'm talking about now, as well as in the emergency. Well, sir, of course, it's an honor to be speaking to you. I've read many of your uh, writings during my time at university. Actually, I can't hear you. Hello? Is it better now? Yeah. Right. My question was regarding uh, a particular phrase that you mentioned. You said, for whom was freedom attained? It was for the people. So uh, I'm not a political scientist, but uh, I mean, uh, I know that there was a great uh, social inequality. There's great economic inequality that can be explained um, you know, using a Gini coefficient. How do you feel that freedom is distilled down through levels of inequality uh, at that time and maybe today? So, yeah, that's, that's a very relevant question. Uh, I was actually trying to say that this was the claim that maybe I didn't clarify it as well as I should have. This was the claim that was made and this was the claim that was enshrined in the Constitution of India that freedom was attained for the people in the name of the people and by the people, and the people made the constitution. That's how the constitution begins. We the people of India and so on and so forth. So, of course, social and economic inequalities were part of India's history and the legacy that came with that history into independent India. So that's another facet to the point that when Nehru spoke about we made a tryst with destiny, he was leaving out a lot of people who were not part of the we because they were not part of the mainstream socio-economic hierarchy that existed in India. And even after 75 years, and a lot of rhetoric and a lot of policy measures, et cetera, et cetera, we have actually not even touched the surface of those inequalities. That's part of the tragedy of 75 years of independence that 
we do not even recognize that we have not addressed these issues. We have time for one more question. Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, from India at 75 to India at 100, how does India go about strengthening the foundations of democracy? I think I answered this question when I said that I can't look into the future. I'm a very old-fashioned historian. I look at the past and try and understand the past. I'm not a prophet. Uh, maybe reflections from history, what has worked according to you? I don't think history teaches us anything. If history teaches us, any, if history taught us something, we wouldn't be in the plight that we are, not just in India, but in Ukraine, in Europe, and in the rest of the world. Oxford Bookstore would like to thank you. Would you like to that? And there is something from the Publishers and Booksellers Guild in Kolkata. We are deeply honored that uh, Professor Rudrangshu Mukherjee, Chancellor of Ashoka University, was able to come here to Kolkata to deliver the Jeet Paul Memorial Lecture around uh, the theme of India at 75 years. Thank you, uh, Professor Mukherjee, once again. Thank you for taking all the trouble. Uh, we are now going about to start the next panel on Bangla Shahitu ki ego chhe na pichhe. Uh, but before that, we have a short interlude by Shorbani Mukhopadhyay, who's 